this is uh, Tony Cross with um, Rahul Jain from Singapore, um, who's here. Also with uh, Thomas Watson, who's starting as a professor at uh, Menzies. He didn't really bother showing up. So this work is about taking loyal bounds and decisive linear programs that uh, express interesting policies. Typically, we care about holidays that appear in Bombay's Soil Optimization Map. But really, for any holiday queue, you can define it um, with extensions and complexities um, of the least number of inequalities and linear programs that are possible. So here, if a holiday queue is n-dimensional, you have n variables in your LP, and maybe some auxiliary variables as well. So to be perfectly mathematically precise, what we're looking for is the least number of factors in maybe a higher dimension of a holiday that project onto the holiday we care about. So this picture is actually plagiarized from every talk on the subject, uh, which explains uh, uh, the principle. So I'm looking for um, expressing these two-dimensional eight forms, eight factors, as a projection of, um, in this case, a three-dimensional holiday with only six factors. So I shave a little bit when I'm expressing stuff as a single projection. For some holidays, you can have exponential shaving. Um, of course, we believe that for holidays that are associated with empty hard optimization problems, you shouldn't have them. And so this, this study, the fun history to it, which you can read on the screen, is um, Shiva Venti, so it's literally 72 years old, uh, and sent, sent the question. In the 80s, there were attempts to formulate the traveling sales person problem as a polynomial size linear program. And in response to this, Mihai Yannakazi had this idea that you could actually show unconditionally that this couldn't be done. Uh, he managed to build through exponential size lower bounds for linear program, but at least under some inextricity restriction. So he left open uh, as a main uh, open problem whether you could prove such lower bounds without these technical restrictions. And this is achieved in this uh, uh, recent work by Shirini and others from Stock 2012. Um, I think it's the best paper uh, from that uh, conference. And they were the first to uh, prove exponential lower bounds um, using techniques from uh, communication complexity. So in fact, um, they used techniques that uh, were introduced after Yana Kazi's statement. Um, and, and the paper, in fact, initiated a small flurry of work in this area. Of course, we're not very independently minded people. We're just going to follow the crowd and uh, also study this uh, trendy area. So we have a, a contribution. Uh, our main result, and really only result, is that we construct a family of graphs whose independent set holidays can nearly maximally halve. So an independent holiday with a graph is just the convex hull of its independent set, uh, or really the characteristic vector of its independent set. Uh, this result can be contrasted with what was known to hold simply e existentially. So if you take a random 0, 1 holiday, so that's a convex hull of 0 and less than, um, then you know, most of these holidays curve really hard. Their extension complexity is p to the n. So this is a counting argument, p to Grosso. It existed even before we had these first explicit examples. Well, the explicit examples we did have um, quantitatively, there's only exponential in root of the dimension, so root n. Um, so we have such lower bounds for such holidays, two of these holidays, and gross of two such lower bounds for the max of holidays. So our result is the first to go above this uh, root n barrier of the exponent. I should also mention that for these holidays listed here, the, the root n in the exponent is optimal. So if you wanted to find harder holidays, you had to look somewhere else. And also, from, from these results, just by reductions, you would get exponential in root and lower bounds for the independent set holidays. So um, our result is merely a quantitative improvement uh, over a previous one. Uh, but still, an interesting aspect of the result is that uh, the way we prove it. So I'm going to talk at length about um, our inspiration for the construction of these graphs. Uh, it has to do with um, a little-known connection uh, that was observed by Gruber between two seemingly unrelated areas of complexity, so extended formulations on one hand and circuit depth complexity or 
formula complexity as it's characterized by this KW gain, Cauchy Dixon gain, for the units that are in use. So it's, it's little known paper of three that they mentioned this connection. D is simply the first one that actually put the connection to some use. So it's a, it's a simple enough connection that I'm, I feel like I might be able to explain it to you, even if you haven't seen any formulations of this Cauchy Dixon connection. So just as a, a fine line overview of what this connection allows you to do, here's just one interesting example. I have here a screenshot from my favorite complexity blog, Alan, who, who uh, highlights in rough statistical result on the extension complexity of a perfect matching polytope uh, as, as complexity result of the year uh, 2013. And he's writing that this lower bound is reminiscent of developments he had for monotone circuits in the late 80s. And, and here is a, a representative result uh, in that kind of work by Ralf and Dixon, which showed that um, the matching function, which takes the graph as input and outputs the yes if it contains the matching, is a monotone Boolean function. Its monotone formula complexity is um, exponential in a number of modes. So of course, these two results bespeak of this to be very similar looking. But now this connection I want to, uh, to describe it makes this connection formal, and not only superficial, but there's a simple black box pattern in which rough as this result implies the Ralph and Dixon complication. So uh, this connection wasn't recorded in the literature, e even though it's just an instantiation of this in the literature. And even at this very high level, you're kind of thinking, okay, formula uh, ties lower bounds, they've, they've been studied a lot, it's a classical subject. So, a wealth of material there, what else could you find in that area that you could possibly strengthen into some uh, result in the area of extension formulation? Okay, so that's exactly what we're doing in this work. So um, this work came to be uh, starting with this uh, previous result I had with my PhD supervisor, Tony Kutaki, uh, so we had constructed an explicit MBIT monotone Boolean function with merely the maximal possible monotone formula for complexity. Now, this abstract connection points to there might, th there might be some particular construction in the extended complexity world um, which we go and find. So yielding these explicit polytopes of, ne of ne nearly maximal uh, extension complexity. So at a high level. Let's, let's try to actually go into details and understand this connection. I feel like I'm, I'm an ambassador for this connection. I, it's the one takeaway from this work. I mean, our result is just an, kind of an application. Um, so what are monotone Cauchy Dixon gains and classical uh, things? So with any monotone Boolean function, you can approach it as communication. I mean, there it gives Alice a yes input to the Boolean function and Bob a no input. And they need to communicate deterministically and figure out an, a, a coordinate where the two things, the, uh, the yes and the no input, sit in this monotone function. So Alice has a one, Bob has a zero in that coordinate. It's a search problem. Its deterministic complexity characterizes, you can say, either the monotone search effect of the function or either the, the logarithm of the monotone formula. Okay, on the other hand, um, we have this world of extended formulation. Janakog has already characterized the extension complexity of the polytope in terms of the non-negative rank of this black box. So first, remember that um, non-negative rank of a non-negative matrix is just the number of um, non-negative rank one matrices that add up to represent your matrix. So it's like rank, but everything's non-negative. The slack matrix then associated with a polytope is defined here. Um, so let's say we have a polytope C defined by a bunch of linear inequalities. Associated with it is the slack matrix whose rows are indexed by the fatex, so these linear inequalities, and the row, the columns are indexed by vertices. And for each uh, fatex, each vertex, the slack matrix contains the slacks between them. The distance from the vertex from the fatex, um, really the algebraic distance. It's a non-negative quantity. Okay. So 
this is Yana Kazuchaki again. I also want to use um, an alternative phrasing for an al alternative perspective for thinking about the end of history. And this is from uh, the spine of uh, Richard Grass. You can think of the log of the non-negative rank of a non-negative matrix as a kind of a weird type of um, communication complexity in the world. Here we're looking for randomized protocols whose acceptance probabilities uh, are the entries in the matrix. So of course, general non-negative matrices can have really dark values greater than one. But if you scale all these values down uniformly to small enough numbers, you can view them as probabilities. So they have this characterization that the log of the non-negative rank of the matrix is the least cost of a randomized protocol whose acceptance probability is proportional um, to the entries in the matrix. So this is an input x, y, colon, rho, which is also acceptance probability is proportional to the entries in the matrix. Right, so I'm moving towards making this connection formal. And um, with any monotope DM function, I can associate canonically a, a polytope whose convex hull of the Yeti matrix. It's an interesting polytope. And here I highlight uh, the, some interesting inequalities for the polytope, um, which express the fact that on any input x and y to the Cartan Dixon ring, there exists a solution to this ring. I express this fact as a linear inequality. So I have um, x and y, and I want to say that there's at least one coordinate um, Solved in the Cartan Dixon ring. So linearly, I could say a sum over all indices where y has a real coordinate. So at least one of the xi's corresponding xi's should have a y. So the sum of them is at least one. So it's a linear inequality that's valid for the polytope. So you can then, it's a kind of a facet, so you can look at its slack as if one was the left hand side minus the right hand side, a non negative quantity. So this slack appears in the slack matrix. In this, I've identified a sub-matrix of the slack matrix. It doesn't capture the whole slack matrix, but a, a small part of it. It's an interesting sub-matrix. That's what we're going to consider. And first, let me read out loud. What does this slack quantity com compute? So it's the number of witnesses to the Carton Dixon ring, the first ring, minus one. So I'm going to give a name to this sub-matrix or the complexity of it, the number of witnesses minus one ring, very innovative uh, naming. So here the input is again the same as to the Cartman dixon game, but you suppose the acceptance probability is proportional to the slack, which again is the number of witnesses minus one. The complexity of this game is just lower bounded, the log of the non-negative rank of this Cartman dixon hull of the Yeti matrix. So um, if you prove lower bounds in this game, you get lower bounds in the extension complexity of the polytope, which is the convex hull of the Yeti matrix. Okay, so here comes the connection. It's really, really simple. It's breathtaking. The number of witnesses minus one game is easier than the Cartman Dixon search for Yeti. So it's a, it's a really simple connection, and the proof is also really simple. It's a two line proof. So I claim that somehow if you can uh, solve the search problem, you can solve this number of witnesses minus one game efficiently. So assume that we have an efficient protocol for the search problem. So what do you do? Well, you basically just at least run this search, uh, search protocol once to find a particular witness. That's the first step. You complete this protocol somehow, make it into a randomized one that accepts this probability proportional to the number of witnesses minus one. Well, the minus one is going to be going to correspond to the witness you actually found, this particular one. So the second step is just you sample a uniformly random witness or uh, input coordinate distinct from the one you found, and you check whether that's a valid witness for the Cartan Dixon game, accept this equation. That's the protocol whose acceptance probability is proportional to the number of witnesses minus one. Now you've seen something like this before. Yesterday, Robert talked about this raw sort of magical rank lower bound method. What, what we're doing here, and 
this is how three best gray muscles connection is that it's a non-negative analog of this uh, Rasberg method. And Rasberg method made you remember that there was this magical, uh, yeah, magical matrix. In our setting, it corresponds to the slack matrix. And um, it's, it shouldn't be obvious exactly why these are analogous, but we have to share this for a while. Okay, so I, I really feel like this connection is something that if you work in either of these areas, you need to be aware of. It's, uh, it's underappreciated in the literature. Okay, so in the remaining time, let me just say something that's particular to our work. Um, this connection, simple as it is, it pointed us to the right direction. What could be improving? Is it the strengthening an existing effect? So how do we actually go about proving this? Well, so several people have come up to me in this conference and they have asked the same question. So for me first, do you even lift? Okay, and so the answer, answer is yes. So it's, it's in particular, it's our um, main two strategies. I, I was really surprised. Uh, I went through the schedule for the conference and uh, um, RVFEST workshop. And there are a bunch of papers that are either doing this, this lifting from theory complexity to communication complexity. So either they're putting new lifting theorems or they're applying them. Um, actually, there is even a, a paper from the archive yesterday that proves the new theory to communication lifting theorems. So it seems to be all the rage. Okay, so we, our approach kind of fits into this framework in that we also start with uh, a problem in theory complexity, a search problem called the Python search problem quite close problem. With any search problem, you can associate a um, number of witnesses minus one guy. I define it for partial witness identity, sleeper decent defined for any search problem, any model of computation, whether it's communication theory, theory in general, whatever. The in, in the query world, you're just looking for randomized decision trees with acceptance probability proportional to the number of witnesses in each one for the underlying search. So for this problem, we can show um, a good theory complexity lower bounds, linearly none. Um, it's not even terribly difficult. So once you have that, you'd like to lift it into communication. So take your Python search problem, whatever it is, compose it with some key party tablet to get a communication search problem. Now, we'd like to argue that the complexity is preserved when you do this, the complexity of the number of witnesses minus one guy. And in some sense, there is a communication lifting theorem that is exactly tailored for this type of computation where what we care about is the acceptance probability up to scaling. There is a lifting theorem for that. Unfortunately, that theorem assumes that your gadget size is something like log n bits per parcel. And that turns out to be completely, um, it's, it's really bad for us. In our application, we absolutely need to have the gadget size be a constant. In the existing lifting theorem, we don't have uh, this gadget size down there. So we can't quite apply so in a black box way existing stuff. So instead we just develop an ad hoc argument that for this particular problem, the complexity is preserved and it's composed with some constant like that. That's kind of the main technical uh, thing in the paper. And again, we shouldn't be doing that. Somebody should just go ahead and prove a general theorem saying that you can always do this with some constant like that. But okay, that's a, that's a major problem. So then you're in the, in the communication world, you have a search problem which associates with number of one guy, no number of witnesses minus one guy in each part. It's known that you can take any search problem and reduce it to the monotone partial distribution contained of some monotone function. It's a, it's a known reduction. The reduction is sufficient if your search problem has low non-deterministic complexity. And that this is something that we very carefully control that that is the, that holds for our, in our case. So then you already have now a monotone partial distribution gain uh, with number of witnesses minus one gain each part. So take the convex color of the equinox. That's an explicit hard polytope. And if you like, as a very last step, you can reduce this polytope to an independent hard polytope. That's a very much like an MP hardness type reduction, really standard um, uh, method for polymorphism. Okay, so that's just a 
very quick overview. So I mentioned here a bunch of other problems related to extension complexity, two of maybe some of the more famous ones. Um, can we prove lower bounds on the extension complexity of exclusive nodes for each polytope? Can we separate LP versus SPP extension complexity for each polytope? And Antisarsky, if you prefer, can you use this wonderful connection to suggest these folks um, can you connect this connection to the other folks? And that's it for now. Thank you. Um, right, so a kind of signal here. So when we're doing this reduction at the very end, we just want search problem, reduce it to a partial weak symbol. I said that the reduction is sufficient only if your non-deterministic complexity is small. And if you use gadgets that are that large, you blow up the non-deterministic complexity. You blow it up from log n to a large constant times log n. And you kind of lose exponentially in your non-deterministic complexity. So it's like Specific problem from 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 here, it can be generalized. I mean, the the connection works both ways. Both ways, yes. Yeah. Good question. I have a longer talk on this where I actually give a counterexample and discuss that you can't have the connection be both ways. So that's why we really say that this is strengthening of the partial weak symbol complexity. So there's no 